Hello, everybody, and welcome once again to this episode of TF. It's We're recording two one. today. Milo yeah. has no idea which one it is, and I'm not going to tell him. Um, so. Wait. Yeah. No, this is the bonus, I think, because uh -huh. we moved the other one. Uh huh. You're trying to like fact this like cube. from Thursday. You're like, so I'm pretty sure this one was the one that was scheduled for Monday. So this is the bonus. But however, uh, could I not have mixed them up because I decided the content of this one was better for the free one? I'm afraid you're wrong. Mm. This is actually the free episode, and you have lost your privileges of saying your little radio thing for this episode. So oh, you hate to bad see luck. That. Let's show him his consolation prize. I I'm really glad because yeah. I was. you could probably see my eyes start to widen knowing that we're doing a double recording and that I have to edit this one, have it out tonight. I was like, please, God, don't mean it's the second <laughs> recording tonight I got to wait for. You looked absolutely terrified. Yes, Nate. yes, yes. Uh -huh. see, see, Juliet's paying attention. She can tell. Yeah, it is. It is uh, Riley, Milo, Nate in studio, Alice in TF North, joined mm -hmm. by returning champion Juliet Jacques. Juliet, how's it going? I am all right, yes. That's right. Uh, I have subjected you uh, to listening to several episodes of uh, The Rest is Politics. Uh, what oh, vengeance baby. would you like to wreak on Milo uh, today well, instead of me? it strikes me Wait, that what? Milo is not the person to blame here. But he lost the contest to decide if it was the free one today or the bonus Milo one. Milo is so. a sort of like Omelus child of this podcast now. <laughs> well, yeah. I sent it to you all when the time comes to listen to the first episode of George Osborne and Ed Ball's Frenemies podcast. That's going to um, be an interesting sort of like news section they do up front, I, mean, I, I think. I think that email was mm. sent not to disrupt George Osborne's wedding, but to try and stop that podcast from happening. Mm. Like from Ooh. from the future, from like a Terminator. <laughs> it's like a Looper type situation. Like Ed Balls from the future is trying to stop Ed Balls in the present from doing the George Osborne <laughs> podcast. I um I upset Ed Balls once. I um he was chairman of Norwich City for a while, who I support, and he came to one of our supporters meetings, and my centrist friend wanted a photo with him, so I took his phone told everyone to say Ed Balls, and Ed Balls was like, ha ha ha, you maybe say my own name. Uh, and then I ended up taking every photo, so I made him do it about 15 times. <laughs> um, he resigned shortly after. Yeah. So, it's yeah. so depressing to want a photo with Ed Balls. <laughs> I, know, exactly. I don't know what, what kind of life you have to have led up until that point. <laughs> it's, like, it's like in an RPG game where you've chosen like the truly cursed path. And like it leads you inexorably towards having your photo taken with Ed Balls. I, I feel like Bread bad ending. There is mm. the possibility that a not British person would seek it out just because, be like, I actually got a photo with a guy whose real name is Ed Balls. It's on his birth certificate. Yep. Like that, there is a degree to which you're so, you're normalized to that in Britain. It's banal that a man could be named Ed Balls and he tweeted his own name and now it's called Ed Balls Day. Lord Sugar, Lord Adonis, Ed exactly. Balls. They're like, um, right. Like the fact that there was this Brexit argument happening between a guy named Lord Sugar and a guy named Lord Adonis genuinely made me feel as though I was living in like, like the simulation was glitching, like parody mm. Britain had just become real. Britain had got and, into the machine from the fly with a copy of Charlie and the Chocolate Yeah, factory. you understand why Roald mm. Dahl wrote it the way he did. Like he was just describing reality. Anti-Semitism notwithstanding, because that was his other thing fucking too. And that's not a libel thing. Roald Dahl was literally kicked He's out dead. of some- He's dead, he can't yeah. sue us. He was, he was literally kicked out of some mem like private members club in Kensington for being too anti-Semitic in the early 80s. Can you Jesus. fucking imagine <laughs> what the threshold for that had to be? Uh, uh, answers on a postcard. Uh, no, <laughs> no, so, no. Do do not it, post your, do not, your like, don't do most that. anti Semitic thing. We've set up this thing, right, where we've got please post us the most anti Semitic thing you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, I, I would recommend you For not research. Uh -huh. Please don't do that. Yeah, do, oh yeah, do, do not do that. Answers answers on a postcard and then shred the postcard. Just walk away. <laughs> oh, I've quit the Labour Party. They can't do anything to me. Yeah, it's like when you write those letters in therapy that you don't send. Write the most anti Semitic thing you can think of on a postcard. God, and then shred it and don't show it to anyone and then you will have cleansed yourself yeah that's right no uh so we have a let's few, never speak of this again we yeah. have a few things today we have a few news updates uh we also have a startup we're going to be talking a little bit about the phenomenon of the polite disagreement podcast it's an, es it's a, uh, an episode i've wanted to do specifically with juliet for a few weeks ever since I think my tolerance to just exist in a world with that kind of boiled over with the George Osborne and Balls thing. And then I want to read a little bit about um, uh, a little article from The Times by uh, the 
so I, I, one of the world's most uh, just gentle and reasonable men, Matthew Paris. Hmm. Uh, first, news updates. Uh, number one, SAG-AFTRA on strike. Infinite solidarity to striking workers. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, we will be doing a fuller episode on this at some point soon. However, I just wanted to note very quickly that uh, exactly as we were talking about in the writer strike episode, one of the demands of management is, no, come on, let us just capture your picture once and then remake you with AI forever and not pay you for any of it. Well, not even that. Their, their sort of like proposal was, we can put you in the machine and we can like uh, then use AI likenesses of you forever, but we will pay you one day's wages for it. A sh- you know what this is? Yeah, this cool. is the uh, the Russian privatization voucher scheme for Hollywood people. Mm. Basically, we'll give you one shiny pair of Levi's for using your likeness in movies forever. Yeah, you don't want a shiny pair of Levi's, though. That's probably those are probably fake. <laughs> probably popular. In probably Eastern polyester. Europe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, man ironed crease into front of my Levi's. Now they look very smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got uh, Roman Abramovich gave me my dress Levi's in exchange for my shares of uh, Roscoe. <laughs> got my pinstripe Levi's on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, we will be talking about that in much, much fuller detail. But it was a, a little detail I couldn't miss. Um, another small detail as well I couldn't miss, of course, is the ongoing report on the Elon Musk Variety Hour. Uh, where, of course, as you'll all know, Twitter's ad revenue is down. Wait, sorry, have I missed the Elon Musk variety hour coming out? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just had to check because in the era we live in, it's perfectly possible that Elon Musk would start releasing a variety hour. What, like a purely spite-based talk show? Yeah, yeah like yeah. a really weird, with like memes from 2009. Like, he's just basically doing a TV show from 2009. This uh, is now. basically, like, he would be much happier like genuinely, that's what he time. wants to be doing. But like uh, Elon Musk interviews the Star Wars kid or something. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Elon Musk recreating David after dentist. <laughs> yeah, fuck the 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 reappearance of the honey badger drinks when he wants tweet this week is really mm-hmm. well. So uh, a few a few updates because as you know, as listeners to this podcast will know, I am fascinated with the ongoing transformation of Twitter as a company because it represents the cathedral and bizarre theory being worked out in a world where money sort of almost doesn't really matter, or it didn't enough to get him into the situation where he can do what he wants, basically. Oh, they're, they're doing right. literally anything that could be done in order to find mm-hmm. this cathedral, and thus far, no cathedrals. <laughs> and the, the new plan, of course, as I'm sure some of you will have seen, is to take all that money that they get from advertising the anabolic dwarves and the device that shocks you, right? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's the anabolic dwarf that shocks you. Yeah, indeed. Ah, uh, I wasn't I expecting an anabolic dwarf. <laughs> um, yeah, to, um, to jumping out of your wardrobe, things to, of that nature. To now um, monetize creators, which means if you're verified, okay. and people who are verified view your posts and view the ads under your posts, despite the fact that by being verified they see fifty percent fewer ads then if you are someone who Elon Musk likes and interacts with regularly, he will send you a message promising to pay you at some future point. I mean, this is the other thing. Huh. He's not just someone who, he's not just a frustrated talk show host. He's also a frustrated, like, 18th century French king, because he mm. loves to bestow his little boons upon his reply guys. And as we've seen, this has immediately descended into sort of, like, courtly squabbling, because some of the guys who have been like very big on the new right wing Twitter's sort of like um sort of energy have not got their mm. Elon Musk money because they have pissed him off in some way. Oh mm. no. Well, who Kat- could have predicted this? And Kat-, Kat turd to he's lost co- uh, uh vice com to Cat turd de. I mean yeah. I'll be honest with you I wouldn't worry if I were them because I cannot imagine Elon Musk has ever gone back on a promise to provide something that he's ever said. As I, <laughs> yeah. you know, I got to the studio in my self-driving Tesla, um, hung out with my best friend, the uh, Thai soccer kids that were saved by his submarine. Uh, lots and lots of things Elon Musk has delivered on. You know, at yeah. Friend of the show, Devin, they're in America. I'm sure they're taking the super fast Hyperloop from, what was it, DC to New York or like DC to Baltimore or some fucking thing? Uh, no, they, they got to the two most difficult areas to connect, which is the Las Vegas airport to the Las Vegas convention center. Ah, using mm. only a guy. <laughs> yeah, just a guy. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, I have to say, Alice, you know, uh, if Elon Musk is going to be any era of uh, French king, I think 18th century is a pretty good era. Inshallah, <laughs> uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. So the, but in, in losing, in losing uh, Comte Cat Turd of Anjou, um, 
he also is essentially what I think is extremely funny is he's turned into a channel for Morgan Stanley to fund Andrew Tate directly. Well, indirectly, excuse Morgan. me. <laughs> because all of- Morgan Stanley presents Andrew Tate, and it's just very toned down. <laughs> oh, drink, drink water, it's good for you, you need to hydrate. <laughs> Do you remember the things that they used to have in McDonald's with the like uh, the coin thing, where it would spiral down, and you'd put like a pound coin in, mm. and it would go mm. all the way down, and it would donate to, you know, uh, the kind of kid with cancer who isn't wealthy enough to have a pool. Hey. Very bad house. <laughs> exactly. Terrible yeah. house. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Call yeah. back to a classic bit. Yeah, so that's Elon Musk now. He's he is the McDonald's um thing that eats coins, but for mm. funding human trafficking mm. in Romania, allegedly. Yeah. I mean at this point, you know, it's gotta Morgan Stanley presents Twitter can't come soon enough. Um, yeah. <laughs> All funds donated go to the upkeep and proceeds of the Andrew Tate house. <laughs> oh god. <Yeah. laughs> um so, uh, I want to move on to one last piece of news before we move on to our our startup, which is Liz Truss. You couldn't keep her down. She's not out. She's back in UK politics with Fuck a new yeah. project. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And she says, um... <laughs> Liz Hussein Truss Kazvani? No, this is my favorite Liz Truss <laughs> clip of all time, is when she just walked out on stage... And then there was some kind of like tech problem and there's like all the press are just sitting there watching her and then she just kind of like looks to either side and then just goes, um... And then just then yeah. doesn't say yeah. anything again. Like, before you got yeah. to the Kasvani, I thought you were doing like a Barack Hussein Obama bit about Liz <laughs> Truss. <laughs> Liz Truss, oh, secret Muslim. Yeah. Barack Hussein Kasvani. <laughs> so, so, the Liz, Liz Truss is back. Um, if you like her pen, you can keep it. She has, uh, what she has done is she has created a growth commission to try to solve Ooh. the uh, age-old problem of how come economies in the global north have not been growing since the 1980s? Uh, we're going to oh, yeah. we're going to grow Liz Truss. We're going to inflate mm-hmm. Liz Truss. And it's just going to be me and Liz round. Truss competing to see who can spend the most money in the Norwich City club shop. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out the UK would have turned a profit, but someone stole all the government bathrobes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh it basically the growth commission is trying to answer the riddle specifically as to why we don't have per capita growth GDP growth of three percent, but that hasn't happened since like the fifties when Europe mm. was just a big container marked insert Marshall Plan here. Also, like I mean, I wonder if underinvestment has anything to do with it. I mean, oh, maybe, maybe oh, a I have, little, a I tiny have, bit. I have some of their theories here in front of me. Wokeness, right? Uh, well, these are these are more like the technocrats. They're looking for more uh, stuff to cut. It, mm-hmm. I'll, I'll jump to my quote from the end, actually, which I thought was really fun. Um, it was uh, uh, Shankar Singham, one of like the big um, like brains of Brexit type people, speaking on behalf of the Growth Commission, which is just a panel of economists, essentially, one of whom is Tyler Cowen. For uh, economist heads will be giggling that <laughs> Tyler Cowen has joined yet another body to try to say, what if we made Hong Kong but Britain? Tyler Cowen is a guy who should be a surfer. Like that's how that name sounds. That that <laughs> yeah. is not a name that should be attached to an economist. Um, so he is a. a, a so Shankar Singham said, part of the problem is because we've not done a good job in the last twenty years in identifying what the cost of en- of regulation is. The assumption in advanced economies is that we've exhausted all the gains of pro competitive reform, meaning cutting regulations. So, so like, there, was, look, there was stuff that like Liz Truss yeah. didn't get to do in, yeah. because the, she imploded the economy because in like literally three days. the first. Because like she basically got in the plane and immediately retracted the landing gear and it just fell. Yeah, yeah, essentially. <laughs> yeah. So the the argument here is: look, the problem is we don't actually know which what other regulations to cut, which other programs we could cut. So what we have to do is figure out which ones to cut, which is essentially going to be the growth, the the the, the commission. There might be a whole other bottom beneath the bottom of this barrel, and we've got to keep like scraping until we find it. Yeah. So uh, they they I, they issued a report, which once again I have read. I think I'm one of the few very small number of people who actually <laughs> possibly has. the only person. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they say as of today, UK GDP per capita is about 36k compared to about 53k in the US. The average American is uh, earning a third more than the average Britain. Uh, <clears throat> How many, uh, if over the next two days, the UK economy could achieve annual GDP per capita growth of 3%, as we achieved in in the 1950s, and is currently being achieved in, for example, Poland, the economy would be 65% bigger by 2040, which is just what I, this is- Look at the numbers I'm typing into this calculator. uh, Precisely, yeah, (laughs) Yeah. this is, what's happening here is that, uh, is that Liz Truss is having some fun with numbers, Mm. and because she's a big, important person, 
all of her fun with numbers cannot be just ignored out of hand as it ought to be. A hundred pounds. That's a lot. Look at it on this calculator screen. Now look if I press this double zero button here. Ten thousand pounds. <laughs> Pretty you, cool. You might huh? think that the number, um, fucking, uh, Jesus Christ, eight. 8,080, is that what you're... 8, I was going for the one that spells yeah. boobies upside down, but I couldn't yeah. remember. I, I got to like 8,008, like, and I was like... What calculation is trying to do? <laughs> yeah, that, that was the calculation. That was the like really advanced shit going on in my head. Was I to mean, 58,008 to... is the one we flip it upside down. It says boobs. I can't remember boobies. We weren't that advanced in the Midwest. You know, We, we had to settle mm. for simple country pleasures. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. So, um, essentially, the, the argument here, essentially, is that we need to find out what as... A fully developed, chronically underinvested country that used to be in the European core and is now kind of in the European periphery can do to match the percentage growth rate of a country that is coming from the European periphery into the European core with mm. huge amounts of investment. It's a real fucking head scratcher, but they're going to find I, the final regulation to cut that makes that happen. I hate it when the growth of the European periphery comes to my European core. <laughs> the last thing, though, is I want to say is, of course, it wouldn't be a Liz Trust project if it wasn't shitty and hasty and fucked up immediately on release. Because of course, and a slightly soiled bathrobe yeah. somewhere along the way. Uh, I looked at there. Uh, if you I look, mean, at- you did talk about looking yeah. for a false bottom or a second bottom of the barrel. It's like if there's anyone who could find another bottom, it's Liz Truss. <laughs> <laughs> Is there? They published their their team, their advisory board, um, but they forgot to take out the lorem ipsum and the AI generated same picture of a, a red haired hiker ten times. So yes. ten jo- ten identical red haired John Smiths are going to Dolores it and met the economy until it's growing again like Poland. Are, are we sure that this we haven't just sort of like discovered the conservative economic cloning program where it's cranking out John Smiths? And pretty soon <laughs> every advisory board is going to be ten of these identical guys Laura Mipsuming it. In a way, though, it's funny because, like, obviously, we laugh and we point out how absurd it is. But, like, this is the same thing with the reason why you have, like, fully devoid of any charisma whatsoever politicians constantly running this country. Like, the system is set up in this country that basically you either don't get a say or the people who are sort of dictating received wisdom just get hear keys jingling. And it's like, you read this, no one else has to read it, basically, because everyone is going to be like, oh, what a great idea. It sounds like no one even wrote it. No, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> the machine wrote it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like nothing at either end. end. Yeah. It's so indignant. Like, a bunch of people going like, why is nothing growing in Britain anymore? Anyway, the second half of the report will be written by chat GPT. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like solutions, solutions to the British economy. It's like even in, in a fully developed and underinvested country, it's a reminder that sometimes <laughs> yeah, it says, exactly. It concludes with we propose to undertake a research program to investigate the underlying causes of this extremely weak growth in GDP per capita in the most advanced economies, but without looking at any of the investment side. Just no, what can not. be cut. And like the, this this just is... four of these suggestions are from the Ten Crack Commandments. <laughs> <laughs> Did I tell my story about using Chat GPT? That I was no. like, I wanted to see what it would do, and I was interested because uh, uh Alice and I had looked at potentially trying to do a side project about doing a podcast about the Belle Epoque, and I thought uh, uh, mm, uh, a, still do that. Adolf Thier is the is the the best guy to talk about to start out because he his life went from basically born right before the revolution or right after to like literally led France after the uh, Paris Commune and the Franco Prussian War. But I was like, I wonder if there's some good bio bi- biographies I can find. And I asked Chat GPT, and it kind of demurred. I was like, No, no, just find me a list. So it made up a list of real authors, but fake book titles. And said, yeah, here's some books you should check out. And one of them was by a guy who was a professor emeritus of, of uh, European history at uh, UC Santa Barbara, but died in 1971. And the book was entitled Adolf Thiers, The Napoleon of the French. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. the yeah. real guy was Corsican, which doesn't count. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've reached the French race science portion but, of but the show. every that's single right. author was a real person and every single book title was fake. And I was just like, that's Britain. Look up those solutions right there. You know what? <laughs> I, I, before I think, we, before I we move on, though, though, I want like, to. This is the reason why you can't get uh, like a doctor's appointment, for instance, is because of 10 John Smiths all telling you the different positions of the letter N and the word mayonnaise and all getting them wrong. Uh, before we move on, I just want to sort of want to bring in uh, Juliet on the Growth Commission. I've already mentioned I would just base it entirely around like investing in the Norwich City Club shop. 
Um, I don't have any yeah, other no. solutions. I mean, you know, Liz Trust might want to buy some like branded bathrobes. I don't know. Like, we we just socialize the entire economy, but through the prism of Norwich City. If we can improve the footy scran at all of our football <laughs> clubs, maybe the British economy. We know will Delia grow. Smith's like the chairman, right? So yeah. So, oh, she's still. Yeah. Oh, so amazing. Humane AI is the name oh, of the fuck. company. It's called Humane AI. If you follow the tech press, as I do, you'll have known that these people have been in stealth putting out press release after press release about believing in building innovative technology that feels familiar, natural, and human, that improves the human experience and is born from good intentions, products that put it back in touch with ourselves, each other, and the world around us, experiences that are built on trust with interactions that feel magical and bring joy, founded on the principle that we all deserve more from technology, et cetera, et cetera. They've been releasing press release after press release since 2018, saying some version of that, mm. right? They finally released a product, so I finally can talk about them on the show. I've been wanting to for a while. Juliet, starting from you, Humane AI, based on all of that stuff I just said, what do they do? Oh, boy. Um, you can't spell Dignitas without AI, right? <laughs> you cannot, no. <laughs> That's true. So I reckon it's something around, you know, around that whole area. Yeah, the, the, the Dignitas of it all. Mm. Uh, Milo. Um, okay, Humane AI. Is it? I, I wonder if they're going for something like slightly, uh, you know, more like the humane society. And maybe it's Ooh. like an AI that will put down your dog. <laughs> like, you know, you're like, I, I find it too upsetting to put down the dog. So it's kind of like a robot suicide uh -huh. booth for dogs. Uh -huh. <laughs> so what you're basically saying is a suicide what, booth for dogs. So what you're, what you're suggesting is a kind of um, robot police officer <laughs> that mostly kills dogs. That was going to be okay. my guess, for fuck's sake. <laughs> Okay, uh, Alice, do you want to register that as a guest, or do you want no, to issue no. a new one? Uh, oh, okay, humane AI. Um, it, very similarly, but I'm going to thread the needle here between Milo and Juliet and say that it's it's an AI that like gives you the bad news medically uh, as a human. Like it tells you that Ooh. like oh the test results look a bit grim, uh, and it's like sort of it's designed to be a bit like more touchy feely, but I mm. suspect it will not be. That's my, that's my thing. I'm sorry, sir, you're completely cured. You'll have to continue living in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Nate, Humane AI. Um, I think that it's going to be a thing where when your Facebook profile gets switched to like remembering your name because you're dead, it, it's a thing you can pay as a service that it continues to post the annoying shit you used to send to your relatives on Facebook, <laughs> you know, share, sharing new, like Sarah Palin blog or something like that. Just the uh, yeah, remembering yeah, yeah. Alice Cornwell Kelly thing just like lights up at 3am like, damn, this Pepsi's strong as fuck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, the best thing you can do actually before you die is change your Facebook name to The Milkman, so it will then say Remembering The Milkman. <laughs> so then your page can become a homing beacon for all kinds of entertainingly kooky <laughs> racist posts about the vaccines. Uh, Humane is an experience Experience company that creates the, the technologies and platforms for the intelligence age. So I, that, that should clear it up. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't mean anything. Well, anyways, anyway, for spooks, <laughs> like <laughs> I struggle sometimes because I really do. I try to not zone out when you read, but there's something like just hypnotic and I don't know, like sleep inducing mm. about this stuff that I cannot follow any of it. So that tells me nothing other than says to technologies. So it, is it actually any kind of fucking it's a like, little thing. It's a thing. It's, a, it's an object. It's a, they, they've made a little thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, isn't it, that fun? Like so many, like many of them oh, don't make a thing. It's they've an made item. A thing. It's an item. Oh. It's a doodah. Can I, can I add a, this it's to a my inventory? It's a dervish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Alice, you can add this to your inventory. Oh, crazy. A widget of some kind. Uh, I, I love going into my inventory. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was designed by two ex Apple people, Imran Chowdhury and Bethany Bongiorno. <laughs> 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 Fuck off! Yeah. Bethany Bongiorno, the inventor of Hello. <laughs> so maybe, maybe it's it's a wearable tech that once it's determined that your house has a carbon monoxide leak, it just posts helpful reminders or even says them out loud when you have interactions with people in real life. Like, caution: this wearer has been exposed to carbon monoxide. <laughs> this wear this wearer's bl uh, bone marrow lead content is consistent with being yeah. born in 1973. <laughs> imagine imagine this woman like moving to Queensland, but on Australian Ellis Island, they change her surname to Bethany Gaday Cunt. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, an Australian Ellis Island. Australian Ellis Island, right, yeah. <laughs> so together... Hello, Ilo. <laughs> together, Imran and Bethany envision a future that is more intelligent and even more personal and have committed humane to building not for the world as it exists today... 
even more personal. Yeah. <laughs> what does that even mean? The future's well, going to like touch and kiss you now. It's going to be funny yeah. and cool. The future's going to be like, hey. Make very cutting remarks about your like individual flaws. Is it and, like a yeah. wearable sex thing? No, no, no. It's Aww. a wearable that I'll, I'll tell you what it is. Uh, ahem. It's well. I'll finish this. And I'll tell you what it is. So that that not, threw me in a whole different yeah. direction of imagining a future product, which is the like sex toy that is like AI trained on your dick or whatever. And I'm just going to be like rotating that in my mind. For the next you thought hour. Riley was doing shoehorning stuff in with this after following up on from Liz Trust, but guess what? No, it's <laughs> There's a link. <laughs> Rethinking, reconsidering, and remembering and remembering honest human connection in the context of computing. Uh, they seek to reshape the role of technology in our lives. Based on all that grandiose shit, what have they actually done? So they debuted something, but hadn't fully described it a couple of months ago, which was a standalone device. It's just a little pin that goes in your lapel, um, which is, a, they call it a small, lightweight, clothing-based wearable that can be worn in different ways. A clothing-based wearable. You, okay. pin, you pin it on so your it's shirt. So it's a lapel pin. It's a lapel pin. Mm -hmm. uh, and basically... Please say that directly into my lapel pin. <laughs> and what they do is they take a... Um, is they say where we've created a phone, put it in a lapel pin, and then you interact with it by like gesturing at it and talking to it. Gesturing at your own lapel. Yeah, everyone's going to be looking like Secret Service <laughs> agents. It's cool. This is kind of starting yeah. to remind me of the wearable microphone that tells you where you're getting shot at from as long as you stand perfectly still while you're getting shot at. <laughs> <laughs> so it uses optical sensors that allow new kinds of contextual and ambient compute interactions that are seamless, screenless, and sensing. And then they live demonstrated a few of the features. One was taking a phone call, and basically it, it, it vibrates, and then you hold your hand up in front of it, and it projects onto your hand like mom calling, Aww. and then you gesture to answer it. I thought it was going to be like actual gaydar, that it assessed... <laughs> Body language and yeah. motions and stuff, uh -huh. and then it goes to an in ear like a like a like one of those tells uh, you the Kinsey scale rating. auditory aid things that you have. It's like this person is extremely gay. It's yeah. Just letting uh -huh. you know, and you, like you, your phone goes off in like your lecture, and before you before you know it, your fucking phone is projecting twink bussy calling <laughs> like onto the projector screen in front of two hundred people. I really didn't like it when everybody got got those like clocker um like lapel pins, mm. and every time I walk in front of someone, they get a little alert on the lapel pin that just goes she's transsexual <laughs> <laughs> with the music too just, yeah. I, was gonna ma I was gonna make the joke about projecting the emoji for a brick but I don't know if that's uh, <laughs> so, there is an emoji for a brick so this is so basically this is this is um this is Imran commenting uh, we believe AI presents a huge opportunity for us to d redefine that relationship for technology the first humane device will allow people to bring AI with them everywhere and we're really looking forward to revealing more soon um, so, it, what else did it do? Wait, well, um, how is this AI? Yeah, I don't AI, yeah. Well, so the, what it, it incorporates a lot of AI technology, or AI quote-unquote technology. So, for example, you can hold a chocolate bar up to it and say, uh, <laughs> hey, can Who's I- Who's a hungry lapel pin? <laughs> you can say, <laughs> you, hey, you can, can I hold eat? a chocolate bar up to your lapel pin now, it's just, you can, like, be insane already. Mm -hmm. And it will have the same effect, everyone will read you the same way. This is the wearable tech that makes everyone think that you got fucking caught and the DEA is making you wear a wire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be, it's so many people are gonna be like warning killed because yeah. of this thing. Yeah, in case you're looking to be commit suicide by cartel. Mm -hmm. So in one memorable moment, Chowdhury shows the AI pin a milky bar and asks if he can eat it. The device that informs him that the chocolate contains cocoa butter, saying out loud, given your intolerance, you may want to avoid it. To which I then say... Have they not considered that people might not want to share this information with everyone around them? I kind them? of like this now. It's camp. It's like the fucking car from <laughs> Knight Rider. Mm, well, given your intolerance, you might best avoid this. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you want to spend all afternoon on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> Stewie from Family Guy. Oh, so Kenneth Williams' voice inside your fucking. Oh, I'm in your lapel pin. <laughs> no. could you could you interact? With, could you interact with this thing via um via AirPods? Sure, but what mm. really they're saying is, just like what we did with with the phones, right? You're yeah. you are connected to a constant deluge of information all the time, and we've seen what happens now when people grow up with that, which is that they're like four screening different Family Guy try not to laugh challenges. Mm. Right. 
uh, we've seen that. And what they're suggesting, and there's like this wig history thing of like carrier pigeon to letter to, um, you know, telegram to telephone to iPhone, etc. Right? To body to 70s hospital lapel uh, pitch. Twink busy calling, <laughs> sir. Yeah. Shall but, I tell them you're busy right now? Yeah, and... Right. What they say is that now what's going to be is you're it, this isn't just going to be the way in which you interact with like infinitely everyone. Every This isn't just mm. the panopticon. It's now the barrier between you and everything else is the AI thing through which everything will be filtered. So like, hey, do you want to give yourself mental illness? Then mm. why not constantly have a barrier of an AI around you at all times? The panopticoneth. I, I mean, it is interesting because it's like I feel as though the all of the kind of bombast about a tech release being accurate exactly once in 2007 with the iPhone because for better or worse smartphones did change pretty much everything as far as tech goes but there's like the the, the bombastic announcement has gotten dumber and less accurate as time has gone on because it was the iPad okay great it did change something not as much then the segue it's like it didn't fucking change shit. What are you talking about? No, and now it it's gave like, us a wonderful object lesson in uh, inventors killed by their own inventions. Yes, mm-hmm. but then now, now it's it's, it's like every, it's like this is going to change is change the way humans interact with one another. It's like it just sounds unbelievably annoying. Mm-hmm. It sounds like the thing that like you would I would hope that you would be bullied for wearing when you start talking, you know, and like gesturing and it's projecting whatever the fuck. But also like. It just seems incredibly distracting. Like, remember, there was like the dystopian thing when when people were like, oh, Google Glass is going to be this big paradigm shift. And someone's like, this is actually what Google Glass is going to be. And they just made like a video where like you wear Google Glass and everywhere you look, it's just popping up fucking ads. Yeah, you're like, like the Terminator. It's like ads. that. But everyone's excited about it. like here's here's the parody worst case scenario. And everyone's like, hell yeah, this fucking rule. Or at least the people involved with this project. This will only work if it if it camply owns your bullies for you. You know, like someone calls you gay for wearing it and then it goes, hmm, and I thought it was me who was supposed to be projecting <laughs> oh. <laughs> all right we're gonna hire you for the uh yeah. for the voice like, yeah. so basically you're gonna get a swirly before the cartel kills you is what you're yeah, saying yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, oh, I hate my on, cartel yeah. bullies so <laughs> what is being sealed into an oil drum but a kind of acid swirly mm. <laughs> so look i high I, level bullying <laughs> I, I have been following i've been following humane ai for a while uh what the fact that what they came out with was basically a what if we tried to fit the concept of the iPhone into more cracks and crevices of your life when we've seen what that does to people mm. uh, in order to, again, surround them with some kind of an AI um, agent through which they interact with everything the thing is, is though, hilarious. This is going to be really funny if it takes off and we accidentally train a generation of kids to, as you say, only interact with the world through it because at some point they're going to be like holding up a candy bar in front of their torso and the thing hasn't charged and be like, oh, uh, what is this? I don't know if I can eat this anymore. Yeah, all, all of the boomer political cartoonists are about like, oh, the kid's trying to swipe the page left, but the book doesn't swipe. Like, that's going to be real. It's going to mm-hmm. actually yeah. happen. Mm-hmm. I was also going to say maybe this this is the thing Alex is playing with in uh, Children of Men. Maybe the whatever the fucking brain toy thing. Yeah. This is it. <laughs> got we Kenneth missed Williams it. in there. Exactly. <laughs> He's so entranced with Kenneth Williams. His dad has to scream at him to take his pills. It's like, mm, that's <laughs> that's Children of Men. Lord knows I tried. <laughs> <laughs> if it were possible, I'd have managed it. <laughs> oh, Kenneth Williams. All right. Juliet, I want to talk a little bit about polite disagreement. And you can politely disagree with me if you'd like to. Um, is there a few examples of this genre of entertainment that's emerged in the UK? And I've recently found out from a Lithuanian friend that mm. there's one in Lithuania. Oh. Mm. There's a polite disagreement. Uh, I assume it's... Politas yeah. disagreementas. <laughs> this is like of the form of uh, we're two friends with like different politics uh, but and we're going to like hash out the issues together in like a fun way, right? Yeah, basically, you get, you know, two people from across the political divide. So one of them is like a very right wing uh, Labour person who hated Jeremy Corbyn. uh, And one of them is a very sort of like Tory wet um, who was pro austerity. And they come together and talk about, you know, their their differences and what they disagree on. And they get very angry about Brexit and don't really care about anything else. Yeah. so uh, the most famous and successful of these is The Rest is Politics, uh, hosted by um, Alistair Campbell and Tory Rory Stewart, um, who I just always refer to as Tory Rory. Mm-hmm. Um, there is one apparently forthcoming with George Osborne and Ed Balls, as we talked about earlier, um, 
I believe you guys listened to a bit of uh, G&T with Gloria Di Piero and Tom Newton Dunn on the Times Radio a while ago. G&T. I mean, it's dead now, yeah. um, but I think about it every day. Um, There's Dining Across the Divide dining in Dining Across the Divide format. in the uh, Observer where, you know, um, two people uh, come together and they meet and, you know, maybe they disagree about Brexit or trans rights or something. Uh, but they have, you know... Not to activate myself... Uh, for the Kenneth Williams like epic put down thing for hypocrisy, but it, I, I know this is a thing with all podcasts, including us. It's a bit middle class, isn't it? Or a bit upper middle class. The, the there's sort of like the abiding fixation politically seems to be ah, oh, why can't we have nice things anymore, including civility in the discourse or being why in can't the we EU? get along at the dinner party? Yeah, that yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm feeling awkward at. Also, like I feel it's a little bit of a send up to assume these people aren't already friends in real life. Just all things considered, I want I want a different mashup. I want a podcast where it's the guy from fucking Just Stop Oil or uh, Extinction Rebellion who was the carpenter that fucking Mike, Mike Graham tried to argue that wood isn't a sustainable resource with him and Julie Birchall have to disagree, and it has <laughs> oh, to just God. be him him just stone faced reacting and and Julie Birchall just doing the, the the voice that she does that I can't do. Yeah, we, we, we <laughs> you claim to like trees, but also you cut them down. How does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. That's that Tell podcast me. I'd listen like, to. Th- this this country generates some truly interestingly deranged people, and I'm mm. interested to hear from them more than I am to hear from people who's who have been. We we talked about about how um, you know the, the a lot of the articles about how AI is going to replace government or whatever. Right, how that it doesn't really make sense because so much of what of what these people believe and can do and have done and can say is completely predictable and completely scripted to the point that it seems impossible for them to offer any kind of insight other than just tidbits of um, what color napkins do they serve in the Clinton White House? Yeah, and also the fact that like all of this stuff has just been done to death, even if it's not explicitly the sort of you know op. I'm doing scare quotes opposite side of the spectrum because all of these people are right wing liberals. That's been done like in fucking moral maze. I mean, literally everything on moral maze is just a bunch of either Tories or crypto Tories. And of course, fucking um, Melanie Phillips basically being like, you're a racist against white people. Also cut down the tall trees like that is (laughs) absolutely a fucking thing like that has been on all British radio and whatever, like fucking entertainment for so long. Like none of this is new. It's just slightly so more annoying. Juliet, we've sort of established what these things are. You've described them as a kind of cultural product of the centrist counter-reformation in a draft article you've sent me. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, what's been very interesting and very notable is, you know, the the centrist restoration we've got in Britain, two-party system where both the parties are led by, you know, a knight of the realm and a former investment banker is that none of that was done through argument. None of that was done through persuasion. It was all done through, you know, kind of lying in leadership contests, fixing the rules, purging. Um, also just know. top-down imposition. I mean, yeah, that's the thing exactly. that I always, I always explain to friends back in America, that like America sucks and there's maybe the veneer of it, but like you couldn't have a AOC-style upset in a primary or a Dave Bratt-style upset for the fucking Republicans because they just it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who a constituency party selects. They just fucking impose shit. Yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's every a- echelon of politics in this country. It's just like, nah, don't think you'll be doing yeah. that. And since 2015, and especially 2020, that's been um, very strongly reasserted uh, because they've realized that whenever they have any kind of like open discussion about ideas, they just get tanked. So um, this really is a kind of victor's piece, I think. It's an attempt to re-establish the kind of boundaries of acceptable debate um, where there is the illusion of disagreement from people who don't really meaningfully disagree, um, or if they do, they only disagree long after the issue has actually been settled. Um, mm. I mean, I spent some time with uh, Alistair Campbell and Rory Stewart's The Rest is Politics. I've now listened to two episodes of that, which was at least three too many, quite <laughs> frankly. Um and there was one uh, where they actually talk about the art of uh, disagreeing agreeably. It starts off with them congratulating themselves on... Um, I'll add, I, 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 I listened to this as well, and then I read your transcript of, of this particular discussion. This is from last year, and I very nearly 
uh, had to message Milo to say, I need a new computer because I have ripped my old one in half. I mean, that was very much, yeah. I Sorry. really want to see a disagreeably disagreeing podcast. I, I want to see well, one where it gets like properly nasty. Well, later on, they get quite heated and uh, they talk about austerity and they kind of politely agree that Alistair Darling would have been better at doing austerity than George Osborne. Um, but then they get animated about the only thing these people ever get animated about, which is Brexit. They get onto Northern Ireland and uh, Tory Rory provides a trigger warning, basically saying, look, we're going to disagree here, but don't worry, everyone. We 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 all end up being friends in the end. Uh, and then no, that's um, not what I want. I want one of no. them to have, like spilled the other one's pint, right? I well, want to hear the phrase "You're lucky I'm on parole." There's well, like, yeah, yeah, it should be it should be Rory Stewart on a podcast about Northern Ireland, but with a guy who's in a balaclava in front of an <laughs> Irish flag. <laughs> well, be very careful. <laughs> Earlier today, I saw. I, I'm sure it's done because they want to do it for like kids to not be freaked out by. Men medical stuff if it was an emergency but i saw it was a regular london ambulance but it was the library was painted to be the peter pan ambulance and when i see it's like it's like you've been stabbed nearly to death and you've yeah. waited 19 hours for an ambulance but it's the peter pan ambulance that's fucking what this feels like it's just yeah. like who i mean they're always stabbing each other to be fair the peter pan just lot, bleeding so. yeah. bleeding out in the in the fucking paddington bear ambulance <laughs> just like thinking about the relentless t- march of tweeness in this country Oh, well, I'm Dr. Hook. Oh, wait, that's a different guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, there is a great bit where um, where they're talking about the Northern Ireland protocol around Brexit. Um, and they're not even disagreeing, really. They're just talking past each other. But Alistair Campbell mm-hmm. is getting very angry. And he just says, look, I'm going to disagree disagreeably with you if you're not careful. And I thought, yeah, we all remember <laughs> what happened to the last guy who Ooh. did that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so... This is also, you know, we um, they they say that they reassure you at the end of that episode that they've got into a more agreeable position and that they quote love having arguments. I mean, see, this this uh, is the thing, though. The, it, yeah, they like, have such great makeup sex. <laughs> 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 But, like, all of these people have, like, so much actual blood on their hands, whether it's from being in government or from being in media, and none of this, it seems, ever actually makes it in. And there's a real darkness in there that I think, like, disagreeing disagreeably could interestingly explore, but instead we're all, you know, we're all chums. Mm. Well, it's, it's, uh, in the sense that it, it's a piece of, of cultural production that is and partly to politically reinforce a particular like centrist hegemony mm. is like these are the things that we can agree dis- disagree agreeably about which means they're the only things worth discussing because other things are in the realm of the to technical management or to outsource or whatever right or you know foreign policy stops the water's edge yeah whatever. for sure Th- and that's why i'm not interested that's why i want the sort of like really venal personal attacks i want to talk i want to hear like alistair campbell talk about rory stewart's mum you know, you, you want to, you want to hear Alistair Campbell call call Rory Stewart a fucking dope fiend? Yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah, I really fucking do. <laughs> I want to hear him, him threaten to do him fucking David Kelly style. Like, I want Alistair Campbell to say to Rory Stewart, basically implying that he was a sex tourist in Afghanistan in two thousand two mm. when he walked across for some reason. But also, yeah. like, th- didn't they do a similar thing where they had like a head to head conversation with Alistair Campbell and John McDonnell in like twenty nineteen? Oh my god, similar fucking oh. thing. And it's like yeah. McDonnell couldn't bring himself to say that Campbell was a war criminal. No, it's the Campbell constraints of the form. Him. It's the constraints of the form. Because, like, genuinely, that's one of the things about this as a medium, is it forces this kind of niceness. And it's like, no, I don't want to see that. I want to see Alistair Campbell sit down with Rory Stewart. Rory Stewart says something anodyne, and Alistair Campbell says, hmm, interesting, Bacha Bazi much? Like, that's yeah, it. Yeah, I want him to do the thing where, if you where I don't know if you've ever heard this, but the one of the, the sort of inciting incident for the drummer from Blur getting sober, Dave Roundtree, was they were doing an interview with Narduar, the, Herm- the human serviette, which, incredible music journalist, Canadian guy who's one of the most annoying people on the planet. And I guess Dave Roundtree was coming off a really bad night of Coke the night before. And it's the video is the three other guys of the band kind of awkwardly trying to answer the questions and Narduar being slightly panicked. Well, Dave Roundtree is full on fucking Essex in his face, like, listen, you fucking cunt, I'll <laughs> fucking destroy you. And it's like, and he says he keeps that video on his phone to remind himself in case he's ever tempted to not be sober. But like, I just want that kind of confrontation. Mm. Like, I know Alistair Campbell is fucking capable of that. We need these, we need a two drink minimum on political 
polite disagreement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, exactly. It's like Alistair Campbell is the fucking the the the, the bodyguard and yeah. the, the the embassy meeting in Turkey, just holding his fucking finger up after yeah. having shot the ambassador. Like, yeah. <laughs> but it's I don't want to name the person mm-hmm. he shot, but I'm sure there's yeah we yeah. can pick pick yeah. one. This is this is essentially right a a safety blanket that is to reassure you that things are settled and everything is nice, and that the people in charge are all essentially things are back as they should be this is god's yeah. in his heaven all's right with the world mommy and mommy and daddy aren't really fighting you know they're best friends again what's really funny about it is that none of these people are in charge anymore like it's it not only is it a lie on the face of it but also like now people who are like quite a bit more right wing than these people are the people in charge like even this consensus has moved on like the kind of the sort of shit that like fucking Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak are agreeing about is like is different shit from the Blair era. Well, it's think, been pushed further to the you right. Know, the, the best illustration of that is the fact that you have, you know, this centrist restorative project to, um, you know, make political discourse civil again. And I'm always reminded of that line about how liberals are like dogs because they can't hear content, only tone. Mm. Uh, and then they've got, you know, they're like suited sort of, you know, financial establishment men in charge of the two parties. And then they just immediately turn the election campaign into like who can yell the word nonce at each other the loudest yeah <laughs> and it's just absolutely the outcome that this whole fucking thing deserves like well, it's the, it is essentially the uh these two people are so, are sort of quite happily with one another documenting the world that they created right mm. and they are documenting the oh, the version of it that they can see because the world that they created does not threaten them or their friends it threatens a lot more people than it used to the number of people on the inside of the of the of the people who the system protects but does not bind is getting smaller and smaller and smaller all the time, and they can't and won't see it. And it's comfort food. This is what I was driving at earlier, Milo. You kind of alluded to this. It doesn't matter that that things are very different. This is a a kind of cultural product to cover for that. I mean, the whole point of centrism as a political ideology is to actually create a, a very rational technocratic wrapper around successive lurches to the right. And if you see this not as necessarily directly involved, but a kind of cultural product in the service of... Gen X, I remember the milkman. Yeah. It's like, oh, remember when we could do the Iraq war? Couldn't do that now, well, I haven't got the, the resources. But well, that is the thing, too, bring, bring up the Iraq war, is just like here are the people here's one person who really helped sell the case now sort of in the position of kind of bemoaning that we we've fallen so far from these like halcyon days of agreeing upon things and it's like are are you going to see i don't fucking know like who's going to be the, the the figure in that position 15 years from now when things have gotten even more right wing and the guy off, who know. threw the shoe at george bush is yeah. going to do a podcast with alistair campbell no, with george <laughs> bush <laughs> that's the ultimate <laughs> It's called it's called a mile in your shoes. Oh, <laughs> okay, God. copyright, copyright. Yeah, yeah, can't yeah, take yeah, it. Yeah. That's ours. <laughs> you know, TM. But um, I, I listened to a couple others, right? Uh, in fact, that's that's not true. I've listened to another episode of The Rest Is Politics on the anniversary of the Iraq War, where Alistair Campbell was like, "We got a few things wrong, but you can't blame me. It wasn't actually my responsibility. I was barely involved. I wasn't there. I was cool. bullshit. I was feeding him shit." Thank, um, thanks, Alistair. <laughs> Uh, but talk that I so I listened to um, the one from last week where mm. they talked about things like Starmer versus Sunak. They talked a little bit about uh, Biden versus Trump, and they talked a little bit about Israel Palestine. And hearing them talk about like it's I, a great I, three fight card that one. <laughs> the be, the be, I think the most the best illustration of how they understand the world that they talk about and what they're giving to their audience. Um, and I think like Julia, this is something like that you sort of hit on your article as well is that when they talk about the two-state solution, they say it really felt like it would work in the 1990s, and then they just wonder why it didn't without offering any idea of why it didn't. I mean, like, there is this weird steadfastness about clinging to, like, wow, it was such a great idea. It's like, yes, and then the Israeli right murdered the Israeli politician who negotiated it. Like, you kind of have to acknowledge that, that that did happen and everything has been basically, like, moving away from it since then. No, but, you like, don't. Or you can be well, right? But British look, British people, particular, particularly upper middle class to upper class British people, especially in politics, like just have this ability to maintain perfect kayfabe, even when like the set of the play or the fucking wrestling match has burned down. They're still doing kayfabe. Like 
the, the, the fucking paramedics are trying to resuscitate them after they accidentally got their neck broken and they're still doing kayfabe and characters. Look, They'll never the get audience out of it. came here to watch Israel versus Palestine uh, and we're going to hold out, you know. So, <laughs> Palestine's already up the ladder. What do you want from my, me? My impression was what these really, this really is, and so, Juliet, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this, is two old men talking about their feelings. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, the the sort of lack of contextualizing is is really important, as you say, and this sort of memory holding and this sort of inability to really put things in in their sort of historical position. Uh, I mean, there's also the lack of self-awareness, which I don't know is kind of deliberate or not. I mean, there's an astonishing bit where uh, Campbell is talking about Netanyahu and complains that we live in the age of impunity. And it's like, yes, Alistair, we do, don't we? Mm-hmm. Um, about that. Yeah. This um, is like serial killer taunting the police stuff. Sure. Pretty much, yeah. But it's um, almost as though it's like, it's it's like there's almost um, the serial killer being confined by the limits of the medium of like the note with clipped out magazine letters sending to the police. Mr. Podcast, I gave you all the clues. <laughs> yeah, this is. I really, I really hated it when Hannibal Lecter and Will Graham started that podcast together. You know, <laughs> because well, they fundamentally, if they acknowledge things like, uh, if they acknowledge things like the things that led to the two state solution failing, all of a sudden they cannot dis- disagree agreeably. They have to pretend those facts don't exist and then just say, we had this same goal of peace and it didn't happen and we felt like it would. I mean, one of the most astonishing examples of that in the older episode I listened to is where they start off by talking about austerity because listeners have sent letters saying, can you challenge Tory Rory more on austerity? Again, um, what universe? This is like having the photo with Ed Balls. You're writing in yeah. to the fucking polite disagreement podcast asking, can you disagree more? Listen to a different fucking podcast. This is like buying speedy boarding on Ryanair. What are you doing? Fly on a better airline, cunt. And what is this? You shouldn't have to buy speedy boarding on Ryanair. If you're a veteran, you should get it for free. I mean, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but yeah, um, so Stuart says that. Um, the problem was that the Tories cut very deep in certain departments and they should have cut across the board rather than ring fencing the NHS. And it's just like, um. Rory, come on. <laughs> like, I mean, I'm, I'm just struggling to put it into words because I promised myself I would remain fairly zen when talking about all of this stuff and not mm. to start kind of like screaming like that Labour staffer did when he first saw the Edstone. But like, um, you know, just the 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 number of things you'd have to sort of like deliberately miss to think that, you know, the problem with austerity was that the Tories like protected the healthcare service and move those cuts elsewhere. Yeah. It's, um, it's like you've created a hot dog costume out of people who died when they were fucking forced, like go, they were declared fit to work when they were like quadriplegic. And then you're wearing that hot dog costume and saying, we're all trying to find the guy who mm-hmm. did this. And it's like every single one, I mean, if you're a member of the Tory party, you're complicit. If you're, you were in Blair's fucking, you know, inner circle when he was in power, you're complicit. Like all of this stuff, it's right out there. And it's like, I guess, I don't know if you, I don't think these people feel particularly guilty. I really don't. Oh, I've no, never gotten so. the impression. All of this comes from like a place of total impunity and safety. Yeah. I, I genuinely just think that all of this stems from more like saying we want to create this argument that it's immoral for people to point it out. It's rude, foremost, and it's also immoral. And let's just all get along and talk about politics like serious, sensible, grown-up adults, like, and never acknowledge that any of the complaints people are bringing when they've suffered under this are actually real. <laughs> you know what it is? It, it's a kind of, to bring everything back to football and Norwich City again, it is a kind of like mm. post-match analysis from people whose careers are over and now get to be commentators. Um, and it's like, uh, that's such an insulting, horrifying way to think about something that, you know, has life or death consequences. Well, and one of the ways Campbell tried to rehabilitate himself, one of the first approaches he took was to do sports journalism and write these constant kind of, who was the greatest sports person of all time? And, you know, really just reinvent himself as this like banal sports commentator. And I think, you know, realized that before he could rehabilitate his politics, had to kind of rehabilitate himself personally. Mm. And having done all of that uh, through being on like various like 
entertainment shows. You know, I mean, he tried to rehabilitate himself by talking a lot about his mental health problems. And then I think that didn't really wash because people thought about why he might have mental health problems. <laughs> Honestly, um, if you kill a guy, it's tough on the... Exactly, yeah. And if you kill like hundreds of thousands of them um, and you hear the screams of their children when you go to bed at night. I mean, I do um, think the British British public would be surprisingly receptive to the Myra Hindley and Ian Brady mental health and wellness podcast. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> if it was pushed hard enough. It's, um, it's interesting though, because sport washing really does begin at home uh, with Alistair yeah. Campbell. Um, well, the, the the podcast is produced by Goalhanger, which is Gary Lineker's like co-founded production company. And it came about through Campbell being friends with another Burnley FC fan um, who initially suggested that he should be on with Dominic Cummings. And Campbell was like, no, that's See, That that's would too be funny. an interesting exactly. show be because Dominic Cummings is insane. Yeah, yeah too much content. he's an asshole too. He's absolutely yeah. an asshole. And so like the civility ruse wouldn't work. Like yeah, right, yeah, we yeah. are not saying we like him, but like he's a dickhead and he says the, the things that in the sort of British journalist slash politician omerta, you're never supposed to say. Mm. Whereas yeah. these guys don't yeah. and won't like yeah he's kind of got a trump quality he's like agent of chaos like you could send him in there and you could expect him to wind alistair campbell up in a way that rory stewart is simply not going to well, yeah. i mean campbell mm. does stop short of bullying stewart on the podcast but the dynamic is very much like campbell is like top dog mm -hmm. yeah um, yeah well i mean rory he's stewart is sort of like a haunted pinocchio puppet yeah. isn't he like mm. well i would like a treat from mother but like a haunted possible. pinocchio puppet who was brought up reading like annuals from 1928 with strips like you know rupert goes to kenya Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you, Alistair? Have you ever read Tantano Kong? <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting reversal of the sort of the usual dynamic of these things because I remember when this was a thing on like sort of right wing, but pre the kind of psycho right wing that it is now, Fox News. Even where you had stuff like Crossfire, where a, a younger, still wearing the bow tie Tucker Carlson would like d uh, do some right wing shit, and then you'd have like a tepid liberal on to be like, um, well, I actually think we shouldn't do that. To get owned. Another example of that, I think, would be Hannity and Combs, which they eventually yes, got rid of. Yeah. Because, like, even Alan though Combs, Alan yeah. Combs was like the, you know, like you said, milk toast liberal, he was sort of cast because, like, he would be seen as like ugly and like squishy and just like all of the caricatures that Fox News viewers have of liberals. Like, that was a thing in the early 2000s where that was part of their program that's pretty popular. And then eventually it was like, no, we just want sh viewers just want Sean Hannity saying dumb, insane, like, fucking hit yourself with a brick right before the broadcast right wing bullshit like hmm. and that i feel like is indicative of that sort of shift you know there used to be that sort of appeal for that i suppose but like i don't think i don't think there's any appeal for this besides Warning, the, the journalist broadcast contains the opinions of sean hannity mm, if you wish to continue watching please hit yourself with the supply but, brick but, 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 now. But the thing i want to say is that i don't really think that this is meant to have appeal beyond to be a thing that journalists kind of point to is journalists, commentators, whomever as sort of like a, oh, isn't this sensible? Isn't this good? Aren't they doing a good thing? Aren't we, you know, mending the rift of Brexit, which fundamentally is just an elite dispute that, mm. you know, fucking had no, the, 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 the rhetoric around had no basis in any kind of reality at all. Now, I mean, and just to bring it round to the close here as well, I mean, while we are, while this, this projected polite disagreement entertainment product is, you know, how sort of so many people are, how we are being asked to remember the kind of the, tra the, the imposition of things like austerity, the Iraq war, right? What's happening at the same time is polite disagreement continues on the national stage where, for example, um, the Labour Party is committed now to not just to keep the two child benefit cap, but basically says, if you are a poor family, you cannot have more than two kids or we will starve the third one essentially, mm -hmm. you know, as a matter of policy, and who are now... I think that's called a nudge. <laughs> and who are now saying that um, uh, you know, the job center is going to have to be reformed using... A We're reforming benefits to uh, support people uh, better without increasing the benefits bill by using AI. The magical reform, the re reform magic will happen at the DWP. The, the, the thing that it's only possible to, to believe, the thing that whose function is to provide rhetorical cover for further cuts, but that rhetorical cover only works if it's not challenged. If, you, if Jonathan Ashworth says, we're going to use AI to transform the service and raise the amount of people who are, are coming off of benefits and finding employment and lower the bill without reducing anyone's quality of life, 
it you just have to ask him impolitely how that will work and the rhetorical cover is gone and what they lose is they lose the consent manufacturing of the ability to talk about it as though it's sensible right yeah, and, and, and looking to sign on are you you're a strapping young lad why don't you get yourself down to some hard manual labor <laughs> I, I gotta ask this question juliet since we're close in asia and you've lived through all this shit in britain like seeing this stuff the kind of fake self exculpatory retrospective that these guys put out like what's your reaction like like beyond the psychic damage or maybe go into detail about the psychic damage because it just feels like like when i see this kind of things about retrospectives on shit i have personally experienced in britain i want to fucking go insane and i've only lived in this country about five years so what's that what were your reactions yeah i mean it does feel like a kind of mass sort of gaslighting i mean like i said a sort of pulled out certain lines and i mean a lot of it's stuff that's not even that long ago i mean you know sort of campbell complaining uh about keir starmer um you know not having any kind of like radical policies and saying that like people are crying out for politicians who are promising change why aren't there any and it's like mate you you know full well why because you did everything you could to destroy it yeah i was gonna say um, Never mind the uh, the spent casings from this enormous ballista that we used to shoot Jeremy Corbyn with. Exactly. Um, I mean, the sort of whitewashing through the media and through New Labour protagonists' use of light entertainment is not that big a surprise to me because that government was always very bound up with the media and with seeking the approval of the the murder press, but also seeking to ingratiate itself with you know in the nineties it was. Sort of young British artists and sort of Britpop um, musicians, and now it's you know forms of light entertainment like Strictly Come Dancing or The Masked Singer or um, Good Morning Britain or whatever. Who could forget Alan Johnson on well, The exactly. Masked Singer? I was say, yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, if when you want... Jonathan Ross had to explain to the other two judges who that was, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you want the image of the start of the centrist restoration, it's the 2019 election uh, when Ed Balls and George Osborne are sat next to each other at the table in the ITV studios, turning around and glaring at Alan Johnson, like screaming at John Landsman about the result. Um, but it is it is just maddening. I mean, you know, the, the new Labour government was at home incredibly authoritarian, particularly after like September 2001. Um, you know, very unambitious, very uninterested in using its majority to, you know, do anything other than just like entrench a version of the Thatcherite consensus. Um, and seeing all of that, you know, just kind of like whitewashed, especially during the Corbyn years. Um, and their political project relies on people forgetting what they're actually like. And I still, you know, I talk to friends of mine who are just like, well, you know, who still seriously think that Starmer and Rachel Reeves and West Streeting don't mean the things that they're saying at the moment. And that they might get into power and do something, you know, half decent. It's like, well, no, they won't. Mm-hmm. Um, Was that the Green Lantern thing or something? I can't remember. There's something where people were the Green about- Lantern theory of politics that the idea is on- only a lack of political will is uh, preventing uh, progressive transformations from happening. It's a kind of conservative head off argument that says, well, we can't do Medicare for all because you, well, because there are all of these complexities that you haven't considered. Uh, this is usually used in the U.S. Yeah, I'm using it incorrectly, but I guess my impression here was more like it sounds like they're just they they, they think that they're going to do like a stealth. Oh, what was it? Oh, I don't I won't, I won't chase the metaphor here, but basically there's this there's like stealth Starmer who's actually going to do like mm. Nordic social democracy or even further you know further left. Well, he's than invisible that. to radar. They're not going to be able to stop him. <laughs> High altitude Starmer. I mean, and the thing is, right? If there is a secret stealth socialist Starmer on the inside, he's so deep cover he doesn't even know he's there anymore. Y- you know, on- honestly though, I, re- I appreciate like and I, beyond the. I appreciate the recollections and I also appreciate you being willing to to subject yourself to this stuff because I'll be perfectly straightforward about it. I would struggle to do what you're doing for this article and I don't even have anywhere near as much of the personal kind of connection to it. It's just the lying, the just fucking in your face lying that they're doing nonstop, the lack of challenging it, like that sensation of just screaming at your tv but screaming at anything that's playing anything on the radio or everywhere in this country like yeah, it's it's maddening it's and- so offensive i mean it really is just an affront this whole thing and you know the fact that it's so popular um i mean it's not popular enough 
you know, to kind of win an election, this type of politics. I mean, you know, this type of politics was popular enough to screw us in 2019, yeah. but that's about it. Um, yeah, I just find the whole thing so offensive and so ludicrously ahistorical, kind of simplistic, anti-political, anti-intellectual. Um, I mean, I, I don't think the centrist restoration that this is an attempt to sort of uphold, I don't think that's going to last. Uh, I don't think that what comes next is necessarily going to be better and it may well be much, much worse. But I think, you know, things like this are going to be one reason why what comes next might be much, much worse because people are going to look at it and quite rightly think that parliamentary politics is just this like chummy upper class stitch up and they won't be wrong. Well, on that cheery note, I think it's time for us to uh, close down to say, number one, Juliet, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. And... Uh, where can people purchase your new book, Monaco? Uh, they can uh, get it via the publisher, Toothgrinder Press, or um, go to my website, julietjakes.com, and all the details are on there. Yeah, it is a piece of auto fiction about the Principality of Monaco, which, if you uh, listen to this show at all, you will know small, uh, let's say, hyper right wing countries such as Monaco off- occupy a particular fascination for me. Mm. So it is a book I'm going to be reading very Somewhere soon. Somewhere you might find Dario Item. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> That's right. You would find him there. Yeah. Um, also, I would like to uh, remind everyone there are two live shows coming. That's fucking right. There is one mm, in at Britain. Long last, you know, Mr. Both in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> Both in Britain, one, <laughs> one, in, one in Britain, <laughs> one in Liechtenstein. <laughs> yeah, that's right. One, one in, in Barbuda, one in Lin- in in London, one in London on the twenty sixth. Uh, are there tickets remaining? Uh, I believe so. Yes, at the last time of checking, there were. So please do buy tickets to that. That's mm-hmm. in between the bridges in Waterloo. Also, Edinburgh, the fourth of August, is now on sale. Um, that is, uh, this is the first time we're mentioning it on the podcast as being on sale, but it is now already, I think, half sold. So, wow. um, please do, please do snap those up. Mm. And, uh, finally, there is a Patreon, five bucks a month, second episode every week. Uh, if you want to hear us talk to Roz and Liam from Well, There's Your Problem about cruise ships and a secret gated community in Scotland that's employing Navy SEALs. We're going to be politely disagreeing <laughs> with Roz and Liam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're going to be, pol- that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, there's that. There's also the $10 tier for extra Britonologies, for extra left on reds. You know all about what it is. Uh, and finally, there's the stream, 9 to 11 p.m., Mondays and Thursdays. Have I mm-hmm. left anything out? No. Nope. Uh, theme no, song. I don't think so. Here we go. Oh, okay. if you're in Bedford, uh, 25th of July, which is next Tuesday, I'm going to be in Bedford doing a show. Um, uh, I'll put the link up on my website soon. It might not. The link might have been website when this comes out, but you'll just you know have a look. I'll tweet about it, etc. Also, our theme song is "Here We Go" by Ginseng. It's all one word. Look it up. Great song. Play it. Get some stream cash to yeah. Ginseng, who let us use that song for our show. We appreciate him. Yes. Mm. Okay. I think that's about all the end matter. So we'll see you on the bonus episode in a few short days. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.